In this presentation, we will finish up the book of 2 Nephi. We will consider the doctrines and teachings found in 2 Nephi, chapters 31 through 33. So, let's begin with 2 Nephi 31, a little introduction. Nephi's final writings encompass what he defines as the doctrine of Christ. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, In the Book of Mormon, the doctrine of Christ is simple and direct. It focuses on the first principles of the gospel exclusively, including an expression of encouragement to endure, to persist, to press on. Indeed, it is in the clarity and simplicity of the doctrine of Christ that its impact is found. The doctrine of Christ is not complicated. It is profound, beautifully, singly-minded, clear, and complete. End of quote. Strive to focus your life upon the, simple, uh, upon the simple but profound aspects of the doctrine of Christ that will bring you the companionship and guidance of the Holy Ghost and eternal happiness and joy. So with that, 2 Nephi 31, 31 verse 2 the phrase, the doctrine of Christ. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland explained the meaning of the doctrine of Christ as used in 2 Nephi 31, quote, Although a phrase like the doctrine of Christ could apply appropriately be used to describe any or all of the Master's teachings, nevertheless, those magnificent, broad, and beautiful expressions spread throughout the Book of Mormon, New Testament, and Latter-day Scripture might more properly be called the doctrines of Christ. Note that the phrase Nephi used is distinctly singular. In Nephi's concluding testimony, and later in the Savior's own declaration to the Nephites at his appearance to them, the emphasis is on a precise, focused, singular sense of Christ's doctrine. Specifically, that which the prophet Joseph Smith declared to be the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. End of quote. Chapter 31, verse 3, the phrase, He speaketh unto men according to their language, unto their understanding. Meaning, when conversing with men, God and his angels speak according to the language and understanding of those they have chosen to address. To Joseph Smith, they spoke English. To Adam, they spoke pure Adamic. To the Nephites, they spoke the language of their day, and so on. To each, they also speak according to their level of understanding. To do otherwise would be futile. Chapter 31, verses 4 through 10. Having set, he having set the example before them. That phrase meaning, while mankind must be baptized for remission of sins, the Savior who is holy and without sin was baptized and is an example of humility and obedience. Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that by being baptized, Jesus Christ provided an example for all people to follow in his footsteps. Entering into the kingdom of God is so important that Jesus was baptized to show us the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which we should enter. Born of a mortal mother, Jesus was baptized to fulfill his Father's commandments, that the sons and daughters of God should be baptized. He set the example for all of us to humble ourselves before our Heavenly Father. We are all welcome into the waters of baptism. He was baptized to witness to the Father that he would be obedient in keeping his commandments. He was baptized to show us that we should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. As we follow the example of Jesus, we too demonstrate that we will repent and be obedient in keeping the commandments of our Father in heaven. We humble ourselves with a broken heart and a contrite spirit as we recognize our sins and seek forgiveness of our trespasses. We covenant that we are willing to take upon ourselves the name of Christ and always remember him. End of quote. Chapter 31, verse 4, the phrase, the Lamb of God, meant the Lamb that, one, as a sacrifice, bears our iniquity, or two, furnishes the material for protecting an ornamental covering, verse 7, which would be the robes of righteousness, or as in the Revelation of John, where the Lamb is the head of the entire creation, visible and visible, 
and invisible, who leads all that exists to victory and glory. The phrase, the sins of the world in this verse, meaning attention might be called to the plural form of the first pronoun referring evidently to individual transgressors, which the Lamb taketh away on a condition of repentance and obedience. The singular form, the sin of the world, which is the term used by John the Baptist, is the transgression of our first parents, the evil consequences of which would have been the inheritance of all their descendants had they not been removed. But the guilt was taken away when Adam repented, was baptized and forgiven through faith in the Lamb of God, who was slain from the foundation of the world. Chapter 31, verse 5, the phrase, to fulfill all righteousness, means Nephi, to dramatize the importance of baptism, tells us that the Savior had to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. The doctrine is both little, the doctrine is both little understood and marvelously important. In the high spiritual sense, there is no righteousness without willing submission to all the ordinances of salvation. No more perfect example could be found than Christ himself. Christ, who was sinless, had to be baptized in order to con be considered righteous. To be righteous, as the word is used in its highest spiritual sense, means far more than being sinless, pure, or merely good. Righteousness is not simply the evidence of the absence of evil or impropriety. It is the active seeking of the mind and will of the Father and compliance with that will once it has been obtained. In Matthew's account of Jesus' baptism, Christ responds to John's reluctance to baptize him by saying, Suffice it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. The text is quite literally true. Neither John nor Jesus could have been considered righteous had the baptism not taken place. In a general sense, righteousness was understood to embrace the fulfilling of obligations or the observance of legal requirements. In a more strictly religious sense, it was understood to mean conforming to the will of the Father. Thus we see Christ as the personification of righteousness because his whole nature, his very action, conformed to God's will. The scriptures refer to Christ as the Son of Righteousness, or even as the Righteous. Righteous as a name title for deity is intended to convey the idea of unswavering faithfulness in keeping of covenant promises. Salvation and righteousness are thus inseparably linked. God's righteousness in his judicial reign means that in covenant faithfulness he saves his people. Nephi identified four ways in which Christ fulfilled all righteousness through his baptism. One, he humbled himself before the Father. Two, he entered a covenant relationship with the Father promising obedience and keeping the commandments. Three, he opened to himself the gate to the celestial kingdom. And four, he set a perfect example for all to follow. None but the righteous can be saved. That is, only those who are willing to enter into and honor the covenants of salvation will be heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Christ is the example. All who obtain salvation must obtain it in the same manner that Christ obtained it. As baptism was a cry of Christ, so that he might be an heir of salvation, so it is required of all who seek that blessing. Extending this principle beyond the ordinance of baptism, Joseph Smith taught that if a man gets a fullness of the priesthood of God, he has to get it in the same way that Jesus obtained it. And that was by keeping all the commandments and obeying all the ordinances of the house of the Lord. Do you catch what Joseph Smith is teaching? This is significant. Christ has to keep all the same commandments I have to keep in order to reach exaltation. All the ordinances of the house of the Lord. The washing and anointing, the endowment, and celestial marriage. Christ is our example in all things. 
He ceases to be that if we excuse him from compliance with the ordinances of salvation or the obligation to keep the commandments. It would hardly be consistent to announce one system of salvation for Christ and another for the rest of mankind, and then to stoutly maintain that Christ's actions are the example to be followed. Was it necessary for Christ to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying of, on of hands? Was it necessary for him to receive the priesthood in the same manner? Did he comply with temple ordinances? In response, it could be asked, did he fulfill all righteousness in baptism or was more required of him? Could he have fulfilled all righteousness by selectively keeping the commandments? Or was it necessary, as Joseph taught, for him to keep all the commandments? On such matters, Nephi is very emphatic. There is, he declared, but one path to divine presence, and only by following that path could Jesus show us the way. Yes, he had to keep all the commandments of the house of the Lord in order to be saved, just as you and I do. This is something of which uninspired men have no comprehension, stated Elder Bruce R. McConkie. Quote, Truly he was the Lord omnipotent before the world was. Truly he was likened to the Father in the premortal life. Truly he was the Son of God here on earth, and yet with it all, as with all the spirit children of the same Father, he too was subject to all the terms and conditions of the Father's plan. He also was born on earth to undergo a mortal probation, to die, to raise, rise again in immortal, immortal glory, to be judged according to his works, and to receive his place of infinite glory in the eternal kingdom of his everlasting Father. How well Paul said, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author, that is, the cause, of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. End of Elder McConkie's quote. It was required of Christ, as it is required of all men, taught Nephi, that he should follow the straight and narrow path. A straight path is worn without deviation, where is an, a straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, path of spoken of in this text is one that is strict, narrow, and rigorous. Both expressions are appropriate descriptions of the path that leads to the presence of God. In this instance, however, the emphasis uh, is on the strictness with which all who would be saved must comply with the ordinances of salvation. Salvation is found only in willing obedience to the Father, never in neglect, disobedience, or the pursuit of one's own will. As it was, it was necessary for Christ to be obedient in all things to work out his salvation. It is necessary for all men to do the same. Christ, again, has to keep all the same ordinances and covenants that I have to keep, whether that's baptism or all the ordinances that are found in in the temple. Jesus was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Though in the words of Paul, our Lord was made in the hours of atonement to be sin for us. He knew no sin personally. Our mediator suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was, gui was guile found in his mouth. For him, therefore, the ordinance of baptism served neither an expiatory or a purging function. Christ was not baptized for remission of sins, for he neither had committed sin nor would do so. He required neither redemption nor deliverance. Our Savior was baptized because baptized, baptism is required for entrance into the kingdom of God. And so you could say the same of every other ordinance. The Savior obtained the priesthood because that ordinance for men is required to enter the kingdom of God. The Savior had every ordinance of the temple, like I said, from Washington Winnings to the endowment to celestial marriage, because all of those are requisite for entrance into the kingdom of God. 31 verse 8, the form of a dove, that phrase. Joseph Smith taught that the Holy Ghost descended in the sign of the dove. 
The sign of the dove, he explained, was instituted before the creation of the world, a witness for the Holy Ghost, and a devil cannot come in the sign of a dove. The Holy Ghost is a personage as it as and is in the form of a personage. It does not confine itself to the form of the dove, but in the sign of the dove. The Holy Ghost cannot be transformed into a dove, but the sign of a dove was given to John to signify the truth of the deed, as the dove is an emblem or token of truth and innocence. So when John saw a dove come down and lightly sit upon the Savior's shoulder wherever he landed, that sign of the dove was instituted before the world that Christ had received of the Holy Ghost. That was the sign that Satan could not duplicate. Chapter 31, verse 11, the phrase, the Father said. Second Nephi 31 is a most distinctive scriptural test. Text. In verse 11, Nephi records the words of the Father to him. In verse 12, the voice of the Son comes to him. The pattern repeats itself in reverse order in verse 14 and 15. In verse 14, we have a record of that spoken by the voice of the Son. In verse 15, the voice of the Father. Apparently, Nephi finds himself in a conversation with both members of the Godhead. If such is the case, this is a singular occasion, inasmuch as revelation since the fall has normally come by and through Jehovah, who is Jesus Christ. The prophet Enoch seems to have had an experience similar to Nephi's. Those instances where an Elohim has appeared or spoken have been for the purpose of introducing Jesus Christ as his son. In compliance with the principle of divine investiture of authority, there are also numerous instances when the Son has spoken for and in behalf of the Father. Divine investiture means Christ can speak in first person as if he is the Father. Chapter 31, verse 12, Joseph Smith taught, Baptism is a sign to God, to angels, and to heaven that we will do the will of God, and there is no other way beneath the heavens whereby God hath ordained for men to come unto him to be saved and enter into the kingdom of God, except faith in Jesus Christ, repentance and baptism for the remission of sins, and any other course is in vain. Then you have the promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost. End of his quote. Joseph Smith also taught that, quote, there is a difference between the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Cornelius, in the New Testament, received the Holy Ghost before he was baptized, which was the convincing power of God unto him of the truth of the gospel. People who joined the church received a witness by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now back to Joseph Smith's quote. But he, Cornelius, could not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost until after he was baptized. Had he not taken this sign or ordinance upon him, the Holy Ghost, which convinced him of the truth of God, would have left him. See, that's, that's the difference. Having the Holy Ghost to give you witness, but if you don't, then follow up on that witness and get the gift, then he leaves. Back to Joseph Smith's quote, Until he obeyed these ordinances and received the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, according to the order of God, he could not have healed the sick or commanded an evil spirit to come out of a man and it to obey him. For the spirits might say unto him, as they did to the sons of Sekiba, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are ye? End of quote. How will the gift of the Holy Ghost help us become like Christ? Parley P. Pratt taught the following, quote, An intelligent being in the image of God possesses every organ, attribute, sense, sympathy, affection of all, of will, wisdom, love, power, and gift, which is possessed by God himself. But these are possessed by man in his rudimental, rudimental state in a subordinate sense of the word. Or in other words, these attributes are in embryo and are to be gradually developed. They resemble a bud, a germ, which gradually develops into bloom and then, by progress, produces the mature fruit after its own kind. 
So part of your proud is saying we are gods in embryo. We have all the same gifts, power, wisdom, and everything that God has. We just need to develop it under the direction of Christ and the Holy Ghost. Back to Elder Pratt. The gift of the Spirit adapts itself to all these organs or attributes. It quickens all the intellectual faculties, increases, enlarges, expands, and purifies all the natural passions and affections, and adapts them by the gift of wisdom to their lawful use. It inspires, develops, cultivates, and matures all the fine-toned sympathies, joys, tastes, kindred feelings, and affections of our nature. It inspires virtue, kindness, goodness, tenderness, gentleness, and charity. It develops beauty of person, form, and features. It tends to health, vigor, animation, and social feeling. It develops and invigorates all the faculties of the physical and intellectual man. It strengthens, invigorates, and gives tone to the nerves. In short, as it, it is, as it were, marrow to the bone, joy to the heart, light to the eyes, music to the ears, and life to the whole being. That's why the gift of the Holy Ghost is significant. The gift of the Holy Ghost, if we will follow it in its revelations and submit to the will of Christ through the Holy Ghost, then we will develop this Godhood in embryo and become like him. Chapter 31, verse 13, the phrase, full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy, meaning full purpose of heart suggests a total commitment to Jesus Christ with pure and sincere motives, rather only pretending to follow the Lord. President Mary in Gironi, the first presidency, observes such hypocrisy, quote, there are individuals who try to serve the Lord without offending the devil, end of quote. Oh, and you see that. That can never be done. We either serve the Lord or we serve the devil. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. Elder Joseph B. Worthen, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained the importance of sincerely following the Lord. Quote, do we need indeed actually live the gospel or do we just manifest the appearance of righteousness so that those around us assume we are faithful when in reality our hearts and unseen actions are not true to the Lord's teachings. Do we take on only the form of godliness while denying the power thereof? Are we righteous in fact, or do we feign obedience only when we think others are watching? The Lord has made it clear that he will not be fooled by appearances, and he has warned us not to be false to him or to others. He is cautioning us to be weary of those who project a false front, who put on a bright pretense that hides a darker reality. We know that the Lord looketh on the heart and not on the outward appearance. End of quote. Chapter 31, verses 14 and 17, the phrase, Baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. Fire is an agent of purification. When a person is baptized by fire, the dross of sin is burned from his soul, and he thus becomes a fit abiding place for the Holy Ghost. Fire is also a metaphor used to describe the witness of the Spirit that is associated with the receipt of the Holy Ghost. Seeking the baptism of fire, Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, quote, To gain salvation, every accountable person must receive two baptisms. They are baptism of water and of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit is called the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. By the power of the Holy Ghost, who is the sanctifier, dross, iniquity, carnality, sensuality, and every evil living thing is burned out of the repentant soul as if by fire. The cleansed person becomes literally a new creature of the Holy Ghost. He is born again. The baptism of fire is not something in addition to the receipt of the Holy Ghost. Rather, it is the actual enjoyment of the gift which is offered by the laying on of hands at the time of baptism. Remission of sins, the Lord says, comes by baptism and by fire, yea, even the Holy Ghost. Those who receive the baptism of fire are filled as if with fire. End of quote. 
So you can see why weekly we need to go and be filled and renew our covenants because we are mortal and weekly we sin. And so we need little by little to get that sin burned out of us. And we do that as we worthily partake of the sacrament and then during the week submit to the will of God and keep his commandments in all things and always remember him. And then the baptism of fire can slowly and little burn out all of the dross and sin out of us. This is a, pr a pr process, not an event that happens just once, but a process of a lifetime. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles clarified that being confirmed does not mean that the person has received the baptism of the Spirit. Quote, Following our baptism, each of us had hands placed upon our heads by those with priesthood authority and was confirmed a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Holy Ghost was conferred upon us. The statement, Receive the Holy Ghost, in our confirmation was a directive to strive for the baptism of the Spirit. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, you might as well baptize a bag of sand as a man if not done in view of the remission of sins and getting the getting of the Holy Ghost. Baptism by water is but half a baptism and is good for nothing without the other half. That is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We were baptized by immersion in water for remission of sins. We must also be baptized by and immersed in the Spirit of the Lord, and then cometh a remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. End of Elder Bednar's quote. Chapter 31, verse 14, the phrase, It would have been better for you that ye had not known me, refers to, to refuse obedience to the gospel standards, obviously a greater sin for those who have received the witness of the Spirit than it is for those who never knew it. Peter taught the principle thus, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. Such, he said, is as the dog that returns to its vomit, or the sow that was washed to, wa to her wallowing in the mire. The book of Alma explains, After people have been once enlightened by the Spirit of God, and have had great knowledge of things pertaining to righteousness, and then have fallen away into sin and transgression, they become more hardened, and thus their state becomes worse than though they had never known these things. Brothers and sisters, once we receive a witness of the truth of God, of Christ, and His church, and His gospel, you can never get back to neutral ground. Either we stay on that path and return to Him, or we condemn ourselves to damnation, and become sealed to Satan. Second Nephi, chapter 31. The worst enemies of the church are among those who were once members of it. Such leave the church, but find it impossible to leave it alone. Thereafter, their lives are devoted to opposition to those truths that once afforded them peace and joy. Obviously, it would have been better for them to have never known the truth to have become enemies to it. Chapter 31, verse 15. He that endures shall be saved, and during to the end consists in keeping the commandments after baptism. Salvation is the journey of a lifetime, not the event of some particular moment. The glory thus obtained is known only to those who labor and toil to ascend the mountain of faith, the infinite majesty of which will never be known to those who merely praise the mountain's beauty while with resting in its shaded glens. Chapter 31, verses 17 through 18, says that baptism is the gate. Well, the gate to what? President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that not only is baptism the entrance to the church, baptism is also the necessary path to attain eternal life in the celestial kingdom. Quote, when the Lord was upon the earth, he made it very clear that there was one way, and one way only, by which man may be saved, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
To proceed on that way, these two things emerge as being very fixed. First, in his name rests the authority to secure, to secure the salvation of mankind. For there is none other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. And next, there is an essential ordinance baptism standing as a gate through which every soul must pass to obtain eternal life. Baptism is the gate or beginning point for the journey back to the presence of God in the celestial kingdom. End of quote. So you see what it's saying? There is a gate into the celestial kingdom. That is baptism. If you're baptized, you have entered into the celestial kingdom. That should stop us from the worry of, boy, I wonder if I die right now, which kingdom will I go to? I've asked that for 35 years of professional teaching in the church to many members, youth and adult alike. And very few say, well, the celestial kingdom. But they've all been baptized. Brothers and sisters, if you're baptized, you have entered into the celestial kingdom. You have made it. God has provided while here in mortality for us to enter into the celestial kingdom. So once we're baptized, stop worrying about that and now worry about enduring to the end and staying on the path. You have already made it to the celestial kingdom. You don't have to question that anymore. That if you were to die tomorrow and you were faithful in your covenants after baptism, yes, you will obtain the celestial kingdom because you entered the gate. 31 verse 18, the phrase, then ye are in this straight and narrow path, meaning baptism is the beginning. It is the ordinance which places us on the path within the celestial kingdom. The straight and narrow path is not the path to get to the celestial kingdom, brothers and sisters. It is the path once we're inside the celestial kingdom. Because remember, there's three different degrees. And so the path leads you up to exaltation. The straight and narrow path is not outside the celestial kingdom. We are invited to make the journey back to the divine presence with the Holy Ghost as our companion. 31 verse 19, the phrase, For ye have not come thus far, save it were by the words of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. This refers to salvation, which is exaltation or eternal life, comes through the merits and mercy and condescensions of God. It comes by grace. It is a divine gift made available through the love of the Father and the selfless sacrifice of the Son. There are many things which are simply beyond the power of man to bring to pass. Man can neither create nor redeem himself. Such activities require the intervention of being greater, of a being greater than he. That's where grace comes in. It does what we cannot do for ourselves. We do not earn it. Christ gives grace to us freely because of his love. We show that faith in him and that we are deserving of that love as we keep his commandments and stay on the straight and narrow path. That is, those things don't save us. Those things show our faith in Christ. And then that faith accesses his grace. Read Romans 5, chapters 1 through 2. Chapter, thir um, chapter 31, verses 20 through 21, different phrases. First, pressing forward. Having identified baptism as the gate to the path leading to eternal life, Nephi now emphasizes the necessity of our pressing forward and being steadfast in Christ. Those who feast upon the words of Christ and endure in faith to the end are promised that the time will come when the voice of the Lord will speak to them, saying, Ye shall have eternal life. Similarly, the Lord said to those of our day who faithfully follow the same path and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise that it will be said unto them, Ye shall come forth in the first resurrection. The phrase steadfast in Christ means, here Nephi identifies the best meal, sure, the best meal sure of spiritual maturity. 
One is steadfast in Christ when he pursues an undeviating course of obedience and righteousness. The phrase perfect brightness of hope meant the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of hope. Members of the church who chart a course leading to eternal life and pursue that course with fidelity and devotion will be guided by a perfect brightness of hope. Hope is ever a member of the family of faith. The Spirit of the Lord is positive. It liberates one from the darkness of doubt and despair. The phrase, feast upon the words of Christ, meant far too many members of the church merely nibble at the doctrines and principles spoken and recorded by the Lord and His anointed. Few make the preparations, keep the appointment, and come hungry to the gospel feast available to the faithful. The phrase, ye shall have eternal life, meant Joseph Smith taught, quote, after a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say to him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, which the Lord hath promised the saints. And the other comforter is having Jesus Christ himself come to you. Chapter 31, verse 21, the doctrine of Christ meant this is the plan and system whereby the children of God fulfill all righteousness through taking upon themselves the name of Christ and baptism, receiving and obeying the principles and God ordinances of the gospel, and then enduring to the end in faith. Paul stated it as one Lord, one faith, one baptism, while apostate Christianity would have it as many lords, many faiths, and many or no baptisms. Yet there cannot be contradictory truth. It is a straight, narrow path that leads to the presence of God. There is but one plan of salvation, one priesthood, and one church. The Lord commanded that we be one, saying, If ye are not one, ye are not mine. In his great intercessory prayer in John 17, Christ implored the Father to aid all who would embrace the gospel in becoming one saying, I in them, he prayed, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Without such unity, there is no perfection, nor can there be salvation. Thus, the most perfect of all teaching devices is the announcement that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, three separate and distinct personages, constitute the Godhead and are one God, for in all things their unity is perfect. Here's the doctrine of Christ now in diagram form. In chapter 31, this is what Nephi was trying to teach the doctrine of Christ is. We are trying to reach exaltation in the celestial kingdom. That is eternal life, life with God and life as God. The gate to enter into the celestial kingdom then is faith, repentance, baptism, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost because of God's grace, merit, and mercy. So once we are baptized, we have entered into the celestial kingdom. So like I said, brothers and sisters, you don't need to worry and wonder, oh, it's judgment day. Why oh, make it the celestial kingdom? You can know now. If you're baptized and keep your covenants, you are in the celestial kingdom. Isn't that a glorious? I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. He lets me enter into it while I'm in mortality. Number two, the straight and narrow path, the covenant path, is the path that is starts at the gate and leads up into exaltation. That's the straight and narrow path we are asked to stay on. It's the path inside the celestial kingdom to reach exaltation. Now there's another gate. Because remember, there are two other lesser kingdoms of glory within the celestial kingdom. The highest exaltation, there's another gate you must enter to enter exaltation. And the gate to exaltation are all the ordinances of the covenants of the temple. See Doctrine and Covenants 131, and it's talked about in Doctrine and Covenants 132. Receiving all the ordinances of the gospel 
of the temple now opens the gate into exaltation. So now if I go through the temple and keep those covenants and endure to the ends on the path, I will become like him. Can you see, if you receive a witness that you've done these things, you can receive assurance that you will make it. You don't have to wonder anymore. Once on the straight and narrow path, we are, continu we are to continue with a steadfastness in Christ, repenting, exercising faith, keeping our covenants, and receive more light and knowledge through the Holy Ghost, thus gaining a perfect brightness of hope, a love of God and all men, while feasting upon the words of Christ and enduring to the end. If we are faithful to the end, then we shall have eternal life in exaltation, having been valiant in the testimony of Jesus. This you can receive a witness before you ever leave here. And that hope is what helps you get through the trials and afflictions that God will inflict upon us down here to test us to see if we will follow him in all things, even if necessary, of giving up our lives. You see, you can know that you will make it back before you ever get back and the judgment day comes. Just follow the doctrine of Christ. Enter the gate. Stay on the covenant path of the ordinances of baptism and the temple. Keep your temple covenants and your marriage strong and you will reach exaltation. That I have a witness of. That's what gives me hope. I know that this gospel leads to exaltation. As long as I stay faithful, I know I will make it. That's why I can endure the hardships that are placed before me. Hopefully that diagram helps. It helps us from getting rid of the anxiety of, oh, I wonder if I'll make it. Well, he's told us right here how to do it. Gain a witness of it, and that will bring a perfect brightness of hope to your soul and will bring comfort and assurance that you are on the right path. Second Nephi chapter 32, Introduction. All true religion is revealed religion, and it is true, and its truths must be taught by the spirit of revelation. We are told that should a gospel truth be taught independent of that spirit, it is not of God. This explains the necessity as Nephi has been teaching of baptism and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost is a revelator, and as Joseph Smith said, no man can receive the Holy Ghost without receiving revelations. We are not being told simply that those who are properly baptized and have received the Holy Ghost can receive revelation. What we are being told is that it cannot be denied them. As the day follows the night, so the light of heaven will shine upon them. By it, Mormon said, they can know the truth of all things. Nephi here taught that such will be shown all things that they should do. And Joseph Smith was told that by it we might know all things that are expedient for us. Such is the doctrine of Christ. By the light of the Spirit, that path leading to the presence of God is clearly marked. And all that we must do to traverse that path is plainly manifest. Chapter 32, verse 2, the phrase, the tongue of angels, meaning three manifestations of the gift of speaking in tongues are evident in God's dealings with his children. One, speaking the pure Adamic language. Two, speaking in a foreign but known tongue. And three, speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost. When you stand up and give a talk and the Holy Ghost testifies and you speak by that power, then you are speaking in tongues. Angels, Nephi tells us, speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. And all those who have received the Holy Ghost can speak with the same authority. Angels are messengers from the divine presence. And consequently, their message, power, and authority do not differ from the message, power, and authority of their Lord. Or that which God gives to those he calls to be his servants among mortals. One who has received the Holy Ghost can speak with the tongue of angels. For after all, angels too speak the words of Christ, as dictated to them by the Holy Ghost. In 2 Nephi 31, 14, the tongue of angels is called a new tongue. And so it is because it is different from the speech of one who is not guided by the Holy Spirit. Men and women of the world are known by their conversation, and so are the saints. 
Tongues of angels seems to mean superhuman eloquence. But tongues, the apostle says, are but sounding brass or tinkling cymbals if they are without love. So we must be possessed of the gift of charity if we are truly going to speak by the tongues and of the words of Christ as angels do. After a person has received the Holy Ghost and then been baptized by fire, the Holy Ghost inspires them with the ability and the vocabulary to speak with the tongue of angels so they might shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. Speaking with the tongue of angels does not necessarily mean that that person would speak in another language. President Boyd K. Packer explained that we speak with the tongue of angels when we speak by the influence of the Holy Ghost. Quote, Nephi explained that angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, and you can speak with the tongue of angels, which simply means that you can speak with the power of the Holy Ghost. It will be quiet. It will be invisible. There will not be a dove. There will not be cloven tongues of fire, but the power will be there. End of quote. 32 verse 3, the phrase feast upon the words of Christ, meaning feasting upon the words of Christ compares our willingness to receive the words of Christ with eating a sumptuous meal. Elder Russell M. Nelson, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that we feast upon Christ's words when we desire and obey them. To feast means more than to taste. To feast means to savor. We savor the spirit scriptures by studying them in a spirit of delightful discovery and faithful obedience. When we feast upon the words of Christ, they are embedded in fleshly tablets of the heart. They become an integral part of our nature. End of quote. We can find the words of Christ. Where can we find the words of Christ to feast upon? President Ezra Taft Benson clarified, in the Book of Mormon language, we need to believe in Christ and deny him not. We need to come unto Christ and be perfected in him. We need to come feasting upon the words of Christ as we receive it through his scriptures, his anointed, and his Holy Spirit. End of quote. Robert, Elder Robert D. Hills of the Quorum of the Twelve explained that to feast upon the words of Christ, one must absorb and incorporate his teachings just as one absorbs and incorporates a mill, quote, if you and I are to feast upon the words of Christ, we must study the scriptures and absorb his words through pondering them and making them a part of every thought and action, end of quote. More recently, Elder Hill spoke of feasting upon the scriptures as a means of hearing the voice of the Lord in our lives. Quote, if we don't have the word of God or don't cling to and heed the word of God, we will wander off in strange paths and be lost as individuals, as families, and as nations. As with a voice from the dust, the prophets of the Lord cry out to us on the earth today, hold, take hold of the scriptures, cling to them. Walk by them, live by them, rejoice in them, feast on them, don't nibble. They are the power of God unto salvation. They lead us back to our Savior, Jesus Christ. If the Savior were among us in the flesh today, he would teach us from the scriptures as he taught when he walked upon the earth. His words ring out, search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. A testimony borne by the Holy Ghost. For by the power of the Holy Ghost you may know the truth of all things. What a glorious blessing. For when we want to speak to God, we pray. And when we want him to speak to us, we search the scriptures. For his words are spoken through his prophets. He will then teach us as we listen to the promptings of the Spirit. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, we need to remember that. We speak to God, we pray. Now, to receive answers to those praise, we study Scripture, and then he will speak to us through them. Third, 32 verse 5, the phrase, all things what we should do, meant the Book of Mormon promises that the words of Christ will tell you all things that you should do. Elder W. Rolf Kerr of the Seven explained that the words of Christ can guide us just as the Leahona guided Lehi's family through the wilderness. Quote, so we see, brothers and sisters, that the words of Christ can be a personal liahona for each of us, showing us the way. Let us not be slothful because of the easiness of the way. 
Let us in faith take the words of Christ into our minds and into our hearts as they are recorded in sacred scripture and as they are uttered by living prophets, seers, and revelators. Let us with faith and diligent feast upon the words of Christ, for the words of Christ will be our spiritual liahona, telling us all things what we should do. End of quote. President Henry B. Eyring on the First Presidency confirmed the importance and benefits of the presence of the Holy Ghost through regular daily scripture study. Quote, Another simple thing to do, which, God, which allows God to give us strength, is to feast on the words of Christ, read and ponder the standard works of the church and the words of living prophets. There is a promise of help from God that comes with that daily practice. Faithful study of scripture brings the Holy Ghost to us. End of quote. It was Spencer J. Condi of the 70 noted that the scriptures facilitate the companionship of the Holy Ghost when we are faced with important decisions. Quote, you may be facing decisions about a mission, your future career, and eventually marriage. As you read the scriptures and pray for direction, you may not actually see the answer in the form of printed words on the page, but as you read, you will receive distinct impressions and promptings, and, as promised, the Holy Ghost will show unto you all things that you should do. End of quote. This is why we need the Holy Ghost so bad, brothers and sisters, and this is why Satan tries so hard to get us not to use it. It's because once we learn how to use it like he is described here, then we can overcome all temptations of Satan. If we will pay more attention to our spiritual selves and to our mortal, se mortal selves, then we can overcome all the temptations Satan has to afflict us. 32 verse 6, the phrase, no more doctrine given, meant Nephi tells his people that they were that there shall be no more doctrine given to them until Christ personally ministered among them. The full significance of this prophecy comes only in the reading of his visit in 3rd Nephi. Let it suffice at this point to say that at that time the law of Moses was done away with among the Nephite people. The covenant of sacrament given them, the government of the church reorganized with calling of twelve, and undoubtedly Christ instructed them in the performance of vicarious ordinances, as he did among the people of the old world during his forty-day ministry. Chapter 32, verse 7, the phrase, The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, meant, Here Nephi feels prompted to see speaking. One who is guided by the Spirit is always conscious of the proper time to quit as well as to begin. And so Nephi brings his comments to a close by an exhortation to pray always. Wisdom often dictates that we do not tell all we know. Certainly God has not told us all that he knows. The knowledge of heaven is given line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. In the economy of God, there is a time and a place for all things. Ours is to proclaim that portion of the gospel that the Spirit dictates appropriate. As Joseph Smith concluded the writings of the Revelations on the degrees of glory, he observed, quote, Great and marvelous are the works of the Lord and the mysteries of his kingdom, which he showed unto us, which surpasses all understanding in glory and in might and in dominion, which he, God, commanded us we should not write while we were yet in the Spirit, and are not lawful for man to utter, neither is man capable to make them known, for they are only to be seen and understood by the power of the Holy Spirit, which God bestows on those who love him and purify themselves before him, to whom he grants his privilege of seeing and knowing for themselves. End of quote. Joseph Smith said he could have revealed a hundred times more concerning the different degrees of glory if the saints were just ready to receive it. The phrase, they will not search knowledge, meant, as Alma stated, and now Alma began to expand these things unto them, him saying, it is given unto man to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of the word which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heed and diligence which he giveth unto them. Let me just stop there for a minute and say, Alma's trying to tell us, you do not always share all the sacred experiences that you have. You only share the sacred experiences God gives you as the Spirit dictates. 
If you share sacred experiences and you should not have, then God will stop giving them to you. Back to Alma. And therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given to him to know the mysteries of God, until he know them in full. And they that will harden their hearts, to them is given the lesser portion of the world, until they know nothing concerning his mysteries. And then they are taken captive by the devil, and led by his will down to destruction. Now this is what is meant by the chains of hell. Hopefully, we are among those who search for the knowledge of God. 32 verses 7 through 9, the barrier to personal revelation is ourselves. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught, quote, Revelation is promised us through our faithfulness. So also is knowledge pertaining to the mysteries and government of the church. The Lord withholds much that he would otherwise reveal if the members of the church were prepared to receive it. When they will not live in accordance with the revelations he has given, how are they entitled to receive more? The people in the church are not living in full accord with the commandments the Lord has already required of them. We find ourselves, therefore, much like the Nephites when Nephi spoke of revelation. And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stop of mine utterance, and I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men. For they will not search knowledge, nor gain, nor understand great knowledge, when it is given to them in the plainness, even as plain as words can be. Further reasons why the Lord does not give people more revelations are given by Mormon and Moroni in the Book of Mormon. We have little occasion to clamor for more revelation when we refuse to heed what the Lord has revealed for our salvation. However, the authorities are directed by revelation, and this is apparent to all who have the spirit of discernment. The Lord has not forsaken his people, although they have not always put their trust in him. End of President Smith's quote. 32 verse 8, the spirit which teaches a man to pray, meaning... The Holy Ghost will always lead a man to pray, to prayer and in prayer. That is, the Spirit teaches us to pray and also gives us directions in that for which we should pray. To have the Holy Ghost is to have the promise that it will be given you what you should ask. And the promise that he that asketh in spirit asketh according to the will of God. Wherefore, it is done even as he asketh. The prayer of the twelve and third Nephi is a classic illustration of this principle of their prayer we read. They did not multiply many words, for it was given unto them what they should pray, and they were filled with desire. Brothers and sisters, we are to seek the Spirit, not to only lead us to pray, but to lead us what to say in prayer. Then we will always ask for that as what is right. The phrase, the evil spirit teaches a man not to pray, meant the true servant of the Lord has ever been found testifying of his message and challenging those to whom he speaks to seek a spiritual confirmation of it. Ask of God has been his affirmation, for he giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. If a person seeks to know the verity or truth of the Book of Mormon, he should accept the challenge to read it, ponder it, its teachings, and ask of God with an honest heart, meaning that you will live the things taught therein if you're given a, a witness. Yet we know full well that no opponent of the Book of Mormon would ever stand before his congregation, inviting them to read it and pray to know of its truthfulness. All manner of argument is used against Joseph Smith in our testimony that he is a prophet. Yet we never hear of the prophet's opponents inviting others to read the Joseph Smith story as he himself told it and then pray to know of its truthfulness. Even though the Bible teaches exactly that's what you should do. It has ever been the purpose of the adversary to separate men from all association with God or his spirit. No servant of God has ever argued that the heavens are sealed or that the canon of scripture is full. No servant of God has ever suggested that the honest should not seek his direction in all things. It is, as Nephi said, an evil spirit that teacheth a man not to pray. 32 verse 9, the phrase, you must pray always, 
President James E. Faust of the First Presidency counseled that prayer is a lifeline to God. Quote, when God places man on the earth, prayer became the lifeline between mankind and God. Thus, in Adam's generation, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Through all generations since that time, prayer has filled a very important human need. Each of us has problems that we cannot solve and weaknesses that we cannot conquer without reaching out through prayer to a higher source of strength. That source is the God of heaven to whom we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. As we pray, we should think of our Father in heaven as possessing all knowledge, understanding, love, and compassion. End of President Faust's quote. The phrase, you must not perform anything save in the first place you must pray, meant, though we counsel with the Lord in all things, we need not be commanded in all things. The principle in Holy Writ need not be revealed anew to gratify those seeking some kind of heavenly manifestation. Yet in all things we are entitled to the confirmation of the Spirit. The phrase, pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, meant to pray to the Father in the name of the Son has ever been the true order of worship. Such was the manner of Adam's prayers and the prayers of all righteous men and women from that day. We pray in Christ's name when our mind is the mind of Christ, our wishes the wishes of Christ, when his words abide, abide in us. We then ask for things that it is possible for God to grant. Many prayers remain unanswered because they not, are not in Christ's name at all. They in no way represent his mind, but spring out of the selfishness of man's heart. So to pray in the name of Christ is not just to say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. To pray in the name of Christ is to have the Holy Ghost tell us what we should pray for. Therefore, we do not ask amiss. The phrase, he will consecrate thy performance, meaning all that we do in the name of the Lord should be done with the approbation of the Lord's Spirit. Works of righteousness properly done sanctify the soul. Our last chapter, 2 Nephi 33. Here's just a quick summary of 33 verses 1 through 15. Verse 1, Nephi, standing at the borderline of the great hereafter, opens his heart to his people as perhaps never before. First, his own laboriously executed work passes before him, and he finds it imperfect in high degree. In all humility, he confesses its defects, yet he realizes that the Holy Ghost is the source of that power, and that the Holy Ghost will testify of the truthfulness of that which he has written. The principle that if you receive not the Spirit you shall not teach is as true of that which is written as of that which is spoken. Conversely, we might say that if the message is from God, the Spirit will bear witness of it, whether it is delivered orally or in writing. Verses 2-3 through three, He realizes that many will harden their hearts against the Holy Spirit and reject His words because they deny the Spirit of Revelation. Yet Nephi knows of their great worth and will pray continually for those who will not believe in them. Verse 4, at the same time he finds consolation in the fact that he has written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that he has consecrated his work by constant prayers and supplication, for they encourage men to do good and to live righteously. They testify of the faith held by the fathers and witness that Jesus was the Christ. They gave hope to all who would endure in righteousness to the end and promised that the blessings of heaven would be theirs, even eternal life. Verse 5, Nephi knows many will be angry with his words because they warn against sin and only those who are of the spirit of the devil will reject them. The book marks the path by which we return to God and there is but one spirit that opposes such a journey. Verse 6, this makes him feel to sing for joy because the books of Nephi, like the Book of Mormon itself, teach the gospel with a plainness unmatched by any other scriptural records that has been free, freed from the dominion of Satan and brought under the dominion and power of God. Verse 7, this clears the atmosphere and outlook and the outlook becomes brighter. He loves his people and knows that many of them will stand spotless before the judgment seat because they have accepted that which he and his fellow prophets wrote. Verse 8, he loves the Jews, the people whence he came, 
The family of Levi considered themselves Jews, not meaning they were the tribe of Judah, but rather because they had been citizens of the kingdom of Judah. Verse 9, he loves the Gentiles who have accepted Christ as their Redeemer and have entered the gate and walked on the straight and narrow path. Salvation comes on God's terms and his only. Christ, we are told, is the way and the truth and the life, and none obtain the presence of the Father except through him. Verses 10 through 12, he assures all Jews and Gentiles that if they believe in Christ, they will also believe his words Nephi has written. For he says they are the words of Christ, and his prayer for all is that we may be saved in the kingdom at the last day. Brigham Young states, quote, There is not that person on the face of the earth who has had the privilege of learning the gospel of Jesus Christ from these two books, the Bible and the Book of Mormon, that can say that one is true and the other is false. No Latter-day Saint, no man or woman, can say the Book of Mormon is true and at the same time say the Bible is untrue. And if one be true, both are true. If one be false, both are false. End of quote. That's how you know who true Christians are that are not of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, for when they hear the gospel, they will accept the Book of Mormon. Nephi, as with all the holy prophets since, since the world began, will stand at the judgment bar of God as a witness against those who rejected his testimony. Moroni used similar language in sealing his testimony of the Book of Mormon, saying, I soon go to rest in the paradise of God until my spirit and body shall reunite again. I am brought forth triumphant through the air to meet you before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah, the eternal judge of both quick and dead. Verse 13, Nephi's words will cry from the dust, meaning Nephi understood the destiny of the record that he was keeping. He knew that it would yet spring forth out of the earth, carrying the testimony of those whose bodies had long since returned to the dust. To believers in Christ, he says, farewell until that great day shall come. Verse 14, to unbelievers, he says, I bid unto you an everlasting farewell, for these words shall condemn you at the last day. All will be judged by the manner in which they accept or reject the voice of prophecy as it was available to them, either in scriptural writ or by the voice of living prophets. Verse 15, for what I saw on earth, meaning what I ha he had written, shall be brought against you at the judgment bar. It is the pattern of prophets of all ages to seal their testimony, teachings with a testimony that what they have taught is divine truth. Third, chapter 31, verse 1, the phrase carried unto the heart. Elder Down H. Oaks, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, gave an example of carrying the gospel unto the hearts of the children of men. Quote, President Hinckley stated an important corollary to the commandment to teach by the Spirit when he issued this challenge. We must get our teachers to speak out of their hearts rather than out of their books, to communicate their love for the Lord and his precious work, and somehow it will catch fire into the hearts those teach. That is our objective, to have love of God and commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ catch fire in the hearts of those we teach. End of quote. Elder David A. Bednar explained that the hearer of the word must also be willing to receive by the Spirit. Nephi teaches this when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost carrieth the message unto the hearts of the children of men. Please notice how the power of the Spirit carries the message unto, but not necessarily into the heart. A teacher can explain, demonstrate, persuade, and testify, and do so with great spiritual power and effectiveness. Ultimately, however, the content of a message and the witness of the Holy Ghost penetrate into the heart only if a receiver allows them to enter. End of quote. Interesting that Nephi said into. It's up to us if it gets into our hearts. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you have learned the doctrine of Christ and how you and I can know, even before we die, that we can gain a great hope that we will return into the celestial kingdom and reach exaltation. And that knowledge will help us to endure any and all hardships here in mortality. Thank you. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.